And of course, there are uh, machines, contraptions to harness this, basically be a Dyson sphere, an enveloping sphere around the stationary black hole. So I want it to be a sphere that harnesses and gathers all the light energy emitted, the photons emitted via Hawking radiation. are like me, then you've always been interested in the big bank. And, uh, you know, when you think about the big bank, it kind of always makes me think, well, what's on the other side of that spectrum? You know, what's on the other side of that timeline? How does the universe really end? loved considering these topics from a scientific point point of view it's like it's like speculating on god the existence in nature what if trillions of years in the future in the midst of a dark cold, slow, lonely, heat death, the universe still harbors civilizations that flourish around the last remaining sources of energy. And after those trillions of years, as the fabric of the universe continues to expand faster than distant light can traverse And all those fleeting galaxies inevitably slip over the cosmological horizon. And all the local stars exhale their last explosive breath. What celestial hearth? What celestial hearth is left for them? to huddle around. Well, black holes are a probable, the most probable example.
So tonight, I want to explore the concept of using black holes as the last power source to feed a future species that may even be our remote descendants. However electronically hybridized they may by then be. So if you are interested at all in exploring these ideas any further, please go check out the channel that I was informed and inspired by. Um, mainly Isaac Arthur, John Michael Godier, and uh, pretty much the entirety of Futurism. Futurism. Futurism.com. Um, go sub and, and watch out for their channels. They, they put out fascinating content. And um, of course, David Butler as well, who I've shouted out before. The first topic is going to be about how we would power our civilizations, grab power from black holes. Second topic is going to be about how the universe would evolve, sort of like my last episode about the end of the universe, except we're going to get more, more in depth about just how stars, systems, galaxies, um, and light itself and matter evolves from the Big Bang to hundreds of trillions of years into the future. It's really fascinating and it's going to be grounded in mathematics and science, but it's going to be heavy on speculation nonetheless. And then we're going to finish it off. The final episode will be not just how we would use a black hole to power the, uh, well, grab energy from, but it's going to be what would that look like? What would those societies look like? And what would be their values and interests, what would be the most meaningful thing they could do at the end of the universe when the sky is black, because there's all the stars radiating heat and light have long ago expelled all their energy and collapsed into brown dwarfs or black holes, and there is no more light and everything is so dispersed from dark energy. I got a couple magazines here. I'm going to try my best to incorporate a little page rubbing sounds and a couple different triggers. Hopefully you like it. And what exactly humans could do um, with all this empty space and the isolation that would be caused from the disappearance of all other galaxies and all the stars in your local galaxy. So that will be the final episode for tonight. Let's learn about black holes and just how we could as crazy as uh, exciting as they are. I think there might be a way we could still harness energy from them. Black holes are thought to emit Hawking radiation loosely in proportion to their size. Their size. It works opposite to what you might think. The giant, the giant, monster-sized black holes at the center, for instance, of the Milky Way emit so little light 
that you need a trillion, trillion years to collect enough energy even to turn on a simple LED for a fraction of a second. Now, alternatively, the small black holes gush out power so fast that they burn out their tiny mass in very short times. So the lifespan of black holes is proportional to the cube of uh, the cube of the mass. So one twice as massive emits only a quarter of the power and lives eight times as long. And one ten times as massive would emit a hundredth of the power then and live a thousand times as long. So as you can see, the size and mass of a black hole would be one of the constraints. If, uh, if we were looking at it to use as a stable energy source, if we can make artificial black holes, and especially if we can feed matter into them to replace what they might lose to hawking radiation. We have, an, we have an excellent power source of things. And black holes are roughly on par with antimatter and vastly better than nuclear fission or fusion. Fusion that occurs in the stars. In terms of energy per unit mass of fuel, They, they are the most efficient. They, their gravitational singularity nature if most efficiently and effectively equates to us being able to harness and harvest energy relative to all those other potential celestial phenomena like stars, neutron stars. And, uh, and they don't blow up like supernovae unless you starve them to death. Now this is a process that would take years or centuries normally, making them a very, very attractive option for power generation and storage. And this is all, of course, assuming that we can figure out how to make small black holes and feed them at an appropriate rate, both of which are actually a lot harder than the naturally occurring black holes. So that doesn't mean that we can't tap black holes for power, but also uh, works on a neutron star, by the way, is to suck out their rotational energy. Rotational energy, rotational energy. And uh, one thing we need to know in order to understand how to manipulate and use the rotational energy is that stars spin just the same as planets, and black holes do. They have a lot of angular momentum, and that is one of those conserved quantities in nature. And just like I have this too.
Well, just like you have mass <laughs> moving through space. the mass gets closer and closer to the axis of rotation. That's exactly what happens. The angular momentum is conserved and the mass is more dense. And uh, I don't know how to explain same amount of mass in a much smaller volume of area, just like a ice skater, just pulling our arms in, the spin of the body compensates for the displacement of mass by spinning faster. And our sun actually rotates once a month, but neutron stars rotate many times a second. And uh, that's actually why pulsars make such handy clocks. But it's only the young neutrons. 
neutron stars you can um, you can actually use as consistent clocks pulsars because they do slowly lose energy and cool with time and this is all the point of that black holes of course spin as well at an incredible rate actually in both of them and neutron stars emit huge magnetic fields that go through and uh, these magnetic fields are is a result of the internal matter interacting with itself and as it spins it creates the magnetic field just, just as Earth does as well with our molten iron core. What's amazing is that we can actually tap into the power of these magnetic fields by sucking energy from spinning magnets, just the way the first electric generator worked, the Faraday disk, um, which was the precursor to uh, dynamos and what happens is the disk slowed down as it leaked power as electricity and think about it you can run a magnet You know, that's just one of those amazing, you know, just the tip of the iceberg in science that if, you know, we pretended this was a magnet. open there, but if we somehow soldered it together, and we ran it real fast, the magnet along this wire, the acceleration of the magnetic field along the conductive material would actually induce a current in the wire. It would make an amperage, which just another word for a certain amount of charges certain amount of electron particles moving along the wire and uh, yeah I don't know I thought that was just I think it's so fascinating because it's so complex in a lot of ways but so simple as well oh. stealing away that black hole's rotational energy now which, which is a large chunk, in fact, of its total mass energy. Is this a pretty attractive option? Um, and there's various, various proposed ways of doing that. One of them is called the Penrose process. The Penrose process. Penrose process. Um, and this relies on being able to remove the energy, because black holes' rotational energy is thought to be stored just outside the event horizon in what's called the ergosphere. The ergosphere. You obviously can't dip under an event horizon and suck the energy out, but we can from outside in the ergosphere. And there's also the blanford snejak process, which is one of the lead candidates for explaining how quasars are actually powered. So if you're familiar with quasars, which I think are quasi-stellar something, I don't know, 
and uh, and how they are the brighter than actually most galaxies. This one quasar is brighter than an entire galaxy a lot of times. This gives you an idea of just how much juice a black hole can actually provide. It also taps the ergosphere for power just uh, and does it by using an accretion disk. So you'd use this on a black hole that already had one or that you were feeding because a, an accretion disk is the disk at the edge of the black hole that you could think of it as a, if you're rotating pizza dough and it's originally a ball and you spin it, it goes from a ball and starts to get flattened out and that accretion disk is like Saturn's disk. So um, I guess I didn't make sense there, but I meant that the quasar emits light from its poles, north and south, based on how much matter it has to suck in and project that matter through, um, out of, out from its own accretion disk. And so because black holes are very similar in nature when they have an accretion disk, the only difference is that the matter gets sucked in. I don't know. How do you do in? Whew, like that. Um, the matter gets sucked in instead of propelled out. So uh, that's all to say. tap into that and use a uh, use the rapidly rotating magnetic field to harness electric electricity from that or we could also just dump matter into the black hole and as the matter falls towards the black hole along the accretion disk we basically will gain kinetic energy, same as if you drop a rock off a roof. And uh, if you tied a spool of thread to that rock and ran an axle through the spool and attached that to an electric generator, you'd actually get a lot of electricity. So. In the same way, you could do the same thing for a black hole, too. So you could think about this concept as you dragging or kind of letting a uh, cylinder that rotates. And as it rotates, kind of a generator cylinder, its own little rotation can induce an electric current inside it and the energy from the black hole spinning around causes the rotation so by letting the black hole rotate your cylinder and, and uh, harnessing the, the electricity from that you wouldn't notice it for a long time but you're actually depleting the black hole of rotational have a finite amount, although you might not know it. Um, so that's another way we could tap into a black hole. Now, neither the rock on a string or even solar panels collecting light off of matter dumped into the uh, accretion disk, because 
as the matter goes over the event horizon, it gets so hot, it starts to glow, and emits a lot, a lot, a lot of light. Hot, hot black body radiation, I think. Um, so even collecting that light off solar panels by dumping planets, you know, entire planets, into the black hole, they wouldn't be terribly efficient. But there's another way. Quasars work, and another black hole power mentioned, um, power method, sorry. For our purposes, it's pretty similar to the Penrose mechanism, but it happens to have an equation you can use to determine how many uh, joules of energy you're going to get out of it. And this equation shows us the power output of a black hole via this process grows with the square of the magnetic field strength of the accretion disk and the square of the Schwarzschild radius, which is basically the event horizon of the black hole. disk and the Schwarzschild radius from the center, the distance from the center of the black hole itself. It just has the gravitational effects that cause other secondary characteristics, like the Schwarzschild radius, to exist. But nonetheless, if we increase the accretion disk and the magnetic field by all of those rapidly 
extremely rapidly, rotating interacting particles, causing electricity and magnetism. And then the event horizon will increase as well. This, both of these will increase if we keep dumping matter and add mass and more mass and more mass into the black hole itself. And in nature, bigger black holes usually have a much larger accretion disk, particularly the ones at the center of volatile young galaxies. But not always. Sometimes black holes in old, quiet, more relaxed centers of galaxies, sometimes they don't have any matter falling into them at all, and therefore they have no way of being detected along the visible wavelength. Um, no, along any wavelength of the electromagnetic spectrum. So we would presumably want to tap that power a lot, a lot slower. And uh, using much smaller black Any of the methods that involve extracting rotational energy will eventually cause the black hole to slow and finally stop rotating. So we will eventually suck out all of the rotation of the black hole. So as things fall towards it, they will simply go right into it and not be spinning around it, and it will no longer have an accretion disk. So once we stop the rotational momentum of the black holes, what's going to be left is a still stationary black hole, and you won't be able to suck any more of its actual moving energy. Even if you dump matter in, you're really not going to get that much of a bang for your buck. But its mass will still increase, making it live much, much, much longer. It's still giving off little bits, but increasingly less energy in the form of Hawking radiation. And, uh, you know, at the end of the universe, when all, again, all the stars have died out, So while larger, or sorry, lighter, less massive artificial black holes can emit useful sources of power via Hawking radiation, the massive ones essentially aren't doing that, at least not over periods of time less than, again, billions, if not. Our 
presumed future for tonight, we have at least a hundred trillion years to get better at building sturdy material. And of course there are uh, machines, contraptions to harness this, basically be a Dyson sphere, an enveloping sphere around the stationary black hole. So we want it to be a sphere that harnesses and gathers all the light energy emitted, the photons emitted via Hawking radiation. But the crux would have to be that this thing lasts trillions of years. But of course by then most of the matter in the universe will have already been eaten and exist, reside inside. Building those machines are really our only hope, is the point of tonight's episode. It's really the only option after we've burnt out and sucked out all the rotational energy from the black holes and, you know, all the stars before that. actually quite a few really good reasons why you'd actually want to wait a hundred trillion years to tap in to the rest of, of the Hawking radiation. But even though you might be, have the foresight to not fuel one of the larger black holes, the most supermassive black holes, because you don't want to wait that long for all the energy to dissipate from a single black hole, and instead you want to use the energy, the more powerful, more, um, the more higher rate of power being exhorted, exhibited, extruded being emitted, I guess, from, uh, from the smaller black holes at a faster rate, you might want to just simply continue to power your civilization by a bunch of smaller black holes, instead of creating one large one that will last millions, trillions of times longer. But instead of doing that, and perhaps risking the possibility of expending all the matter and depleting all the matter in the universe via Hawking radiation, you might actually want to create one single supermassive black hole that emits energy at such a slow rate that it would take tens of trillions of years to even flip a bit, a single binary digit on a computer. And there are some really good reasons for doing that, as we'll find out in the final episode of our Civilizations at the End of Time trilogy. And a little hint is that there might be a mechanism by which we could actually exist enjoyed this too. It's uh, just kind of winging it. Hopefully it didn't show too much, but um, 
And I just love these topics. I think they're just awe-inspiring because the the speculation of today is or informs a lot of the science of tomorrow.